Yeah, I'm, uh, is this on? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of sullen and resentful at this point because I have absolutely no idea what he was talking about for the past five minutes. <laughs> but I heard aubergine in uh, Lubo's talk. And I'm going to try and get through this in, I'm going to try and get through this in one piece. Um, Every time I tried to work on this talk since I got here, uh, Lubo would sort of show up at the door and drag me out onto the street and force beer and pork down my throat. <laughs> so if I seize up halfway through the slot, you'll know who to blame. Um, okay, let us start with a couple of ants, one on either side of a piece of plexiglass. They pretty much ignore each other, show complete indifference, nothing really interesting there. Now put one ant in front of a mirror. Now he pays attention. Now he goes up to the pane, starts to check out his reflection, sort of taps his antenna against the glass, shows a level of interest that he never showed before when he actually was confronted with a real ant on the other side of the, of the plexiglass. Stick a dot of blue paint on his head. Now he goes up, checks out his reflection, and starts to groom his head as if to try and get rid of that weird-ass piece of blue paint that just suddenly appeared for no good reason. He does not try to groom the reflection, which is where he actually saw the paint. This is starting to get creepy. So maybe he didn't see it, maybe he felt it, maybe the paint itched or something. So instead of blue paint, use brown paint, something that blends in with the cuticle, something that the ant will not be able to see in reflection, but which will still itch if itching is a problem. He does not groom. Okay, we're starting to reach now. But maybe it's something in the pigment. Maybe blue paint itches and brown paint doesn't. So, go back to blue paint, but stick it on the back of the head so that it'll still itch, but he won't be able to see it in the mirror. No grooming behavior. I'm generally not one to jump to conclusions, but I'm having a really hard time interpreting these results as anything other than ants can recognize themselves in mirrors which means that they pass a test which is frequently used as a metric of self-awareness, a test which even some primate species fail. Um, the paper that this appeared in, the methodology seems sound. The results are probably as clean as any results I've ever seen in a behavioral study. So why is it that you have never heard of this paper before? Possibly because it appeared here in this really weird online, quote, journal that just screams junk science, all the way from that embarrassing little instruction to author, singular, uh, typo, down to that incongruous stock photo of the smiley guy in the hard hat. This whole website sort of has that faint air of desperation of, of you know, one of those sites that tries to send you sell you generic penis pills <laughs> over the internet. Uh, it is not a peer-reviewed paper. It is not, or it is not a peer-reviewed journal. It is not a credible journal. Um, in fact, it's actually on a watch list for predatory journals. And yet, the authors of this paper have also appeared in a, a range of other perfectly respectable uh, peer-reviewed outlets. I mean, they've never hit the big leagues. They never made it to, to science or nature, as far as I know. But in terms of impact factor, in terms of the, the credibility of the journals, they're in the same basic ballpark, not that much worse than the stuff I was getting published in back when I was a working scientist. Um, and as I say, the study seems sound, unless they're just outright lying about their results, which would be really unwise, because this is a trivially easy study to replicate. I don't know what they're doing in a junk science journal. Um, maybe they lost a, a drunken bet at a party sometime. Um, or maybe... Uh, their results are just so off the wall that no other editor would simply believe them. Maybe nobody wanted to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, certainly, they wouldn't be the first ones to, to get stamped down because their findings did not conform with conventional wisdom. Even so, the idea of ants recognizing themselves in mirrors is so far off the wall that I would not be talking about it now um, if the Khmers were the only people that are starting to ruminate on the subject of insect intelligence. But they're not. Back in 2010, Bjorn Brems, writing in the absolutely top-of-the-line proceedings of the Royal Society, no questions about credibility there, uh, describes research which suggests that fruit flies have free will. 
Now, this is not the um, classic dualistic religious free will that, you, that most people think of. It basically boils down to behavior complex enough to make you unpredictable. But as anybody familiar with the field will tell you, that's pretty much, once you strip away the bells and whistles, the only kind of free will that we can lay claim to as well. Just last year, um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science put out a paper by uh, Baron and Klein, What Insects Can Tell Us About the Origin of Consciousness. Now, their argument is that our consciousness is rooted in the vertebrate midbrain. And since every component of the vertebrate midbrain has a functional analog that does the same thing in the insect brain, insects should logically experience um, comparable levels of consciousness. Now, traditionally, we humans like to put ourselves on a pedestal. We tend to think of consciousness especially as something that separates us from the beasts of the field. We either tie it to the human soul, if you believe in that kind of stuff, or if you don't, uh, we at the very least say that it's a recent evolutionary development. We maybe have to share it with you know, a handful of primate species, maybe a couple of dolphins. Um, but more and more these days, it is looking as though far from being a recent development. Consciousness is, in fact, a very ancient one, much more widely distributed throughout the animal kingdom than we are traditionally used to admitting. Uh, Self-aware ants um, recognizing themselves in mirrors is certainly you know, one of the bigger slaps in the face of human ego that one could imagine. But there are other examples. There are so many examples, in fact, that uh, back in 2012, a bunch of neuroscientists came out of the closet and released the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, in which they claimed, or admitted rather, I suppose, that a wide range of species um, are basically uh, conscious. Uh, they don't even have to have brains like ours, uh, they said in this declaration. Um, parrots have near-human levels of consciousness. They don't even have a neocortex. Octopuses are conscious. Uh, the brain of an octopus is one of the most alien things you can imagine. It's basically a, a donut of neurons wrapped around the esophagus. Uh, Two-thirds of an octopus's uh, nervous system are actually in its arms. Uh, the architectural specifics uh, are not that important, is what they seem to be saying. The motherboard can take any shape, as long as it's packing enough synapses on board. Now, honestly, I don't know how seriously to take this. It's not that I... Um, doubt the credentials of the signatories, the least of whom knows orders of magnitude more about neuroscience than I ever will. But on the other hand, it's not as though these guys were reporting on the definitive results of some classic experiment that settled the issue once and for all. Far as I can tell, they just basically sat down over beers and took a show of hands as whether we should in, you know, invite parrots and octopuses into our special clubhouse. And really, how do you know a fundamental problem with attributing consciousness to anything. Should I be flipping to the next slide? Yeah. <laughs> a fundamental problem with attributing consciousness to anything is that we don't even know what consciousness is. We all know what it feels like because we are all conscious. But nobody knows what consciousness is because physics as we understand it does not provide a mechanism for how tricking electricity and ions through meat can cause that meat to wake up. This, this slide, this is barely even a metaphor. Consciousness is functionally the equivalent of hooking a couple of jumper cables up to tissue and having that tissue starting to ask existential questions about the nature of reality. It makes no sense. You can watch ions hop across synaptic junctions, you can follow nerve impulses from nose to toes. Nothing in any of those purely mechanical processes would lead any reasonable person to expect the emergence of subjective awareness. Uh, Roger Penrose, the physicist, uh, he believes that we will never understand consciousness until we basically reinvent physics, come up with a whole new kind of physics. Now, Penrose has his own theories on consciousness. They are largely derided uh, by the neuroscientific community. But I think it's hard to disagree with them, at least on that point. Some people think we owe our consciousness to our ability to simulate or model future scenarios in our heads. Other people think that it evolved as a result of foraging behavior. Um, Giulio Tononi, he thinks that it's a function of the integration of far-flung brain uh, functions. He's even developed a metric uh, 
for this integration. He calls it phi. He says he can hang a hard number on how conscious you are, whether you're a round worm or a human being or anything in between. Uh, Ezekiel Morsella, on the other hand, he thinks that consciousness evolved um, to mediate conflicting motor commands to the skeletal muscles. That is actually my favorite theory for reasons I, I don't have time to go into now. Um, some people seem to think that consciousness is a quantum phenomenon. Their argument apparently boiling down to basically quantum mechanics makes no sense at all, and consciousness makes no sense at all, so they must be connected somehow. <laughs> um, Penrose and his, and his camp sort of fall into that, into that particular category. And one guy actually argues from first principles that the United States is conscious, that there is a single unified sense of self-awareness represented by the United States. He called it a distributed, discrete, dumb entity. Um, and believe it or not, I know at least one neuroscientist who is not willing to dismiss this out of hand. I mean, nobody would dismiss the dumb entity part, but the idea of a, of a conscious nation state. Uh, personally, I think they're all running a game on us. I think whether their models are right or wrong, uh, they're describing computation. They are not describing awareness. I mean, there's nothing especially mysterious about intelligence. You can see how evolution would promote flexible problem solving. You could see how the ability to model future scenarios would be beneficial to the organism. But why would any of those processes be conscious? Um, you can write a computer program to simulate future scenarios. People do it all the time. As far as I know, nobody's ever claimed that C++ programs are conscious. What is it about computation that makes meat wake up? We don't know. Physics can't tell us. I'm not in a position to redefine physics. So let's try coming at the question from a different angle. Rather than asking what consciousness is, let's, let's focus instead on what it's good for. Once we can figure out what function consciousness serves, we can use that information, maybe, to get a good idea of where we would expect to find it. Now, the problem with this is that consciousness is an internal state. Uh, evolution can't see it. Natural selection only works on what an organism does. It doesn't really care why the organism does that, just so long as the, sh the behavior itself is something that can be shaped. This is a very simple example. There's an obvious survival advantage in pulling your hand away from an open flame. But why this subjective feeling of pain when you do it? How is that better than a non-conscious computational circuit that says, if temperature exceeds certain critical threshold, withdraw hand? You pull your hand back in both, in both cases. Nature can't tell the difference. So why does it have this almost sadistic desire to inflict conscious pain over non-conscious reflex? This is a figure from an old famous study by Benjamin LeBay back in the 1980s. As you can see, time runs along the axis there. Um, this point here, minus 204, this is where somebody decides they're going to wiggle their fingers. That point at the far end that says finger moves, that's the point at which the finger actually moves. But this point way back here, RP onset, that's the point at which the brain boots up its I'm going to wiggle my fingers subroutine. What this seems to suggest is that even things we think of as conscious decisions actually aren't because the body has already started to act a full half second before you told it to. Now, this, um, this result freaked a lot of people out when, uh, when the paper was published. It remains reasonably controversial even to this day, but less so because more and more experimental evidence has, has backed it up. Um, and it's really only the beginning. This guy, Lee Hadwin, he's an artist. I believe he's in London, somewhere in England anyway. And I'm surrounding him here with a collection of, of some of the stuff that he, has, he, that he has created. But he only does it in his sleep. When he's awake, he can barely draw a Gary Larson stick figure. It's a classic legal uh, case from my hometown of Toronto, actually. My stepdaughter just encountered this in her law class um, last year. A guy drives across town, stabs his mother-in-law to death, attacks his father-in-law, drives home, cleans up the mess, unconscious the whole time. A jury found him not guilty. The jury decided that he had not done these horrible things, his body had. <laughs>
So the body is capable of doing things ranging from committing acts of murder to creating works of art without any conscious involvement whatsoever. And this goes way beyond a few lurid headlines about sleepwalking um, murderers. This happens to all of us all the time in ways so subtle and low-key that we don't even generally think about them. To give you just one example, everybody who drives has had the experience of arriving at a destination with no conscious recollection of how they got there, not being consciously aware of the signals that they made, the lane changes, the traffic signs they obeyed, without any conscious attention at all. It's like there's something else in here with us. It's like there's some body snatcher pod person living down in the basement, and it's what's really running the show. And every now and then, maybe it feels guilty about locking us up in the attic. So it sends us these postcards telling us what it's doing with the chassis. But we conscious entities, we're like in complete denial. We insist that we're running the show. So whenever we get one of these postcards, we don't say, hmm, this is what's happening. We say, I will this to happen, even though it's been happening all week and we only just found out about it. In reality, we literally don't even control the wiggling of our own fingers. Now, this is kind of where I come in. Back in the, the middle of the last decade, I wrote um, a book that explored the functional utility of consciousness, amongst other things. It was not a scientific paper, it was not a monograph, it was a science fiction novel. I am a science fiction writer. I used to be a scientist, but I have not published a, you know, a peer-reviewed paper in something like 20 years. Blindsight was a science fiction novel, and it was going to come up with this really cool science fictional explanation for what consciousness did. This was going to be the, the punchline of uh, the book. That was the plan, anyway. But the problem was, when I started doing research, I realized that I wasn't doing any better as a science fiction writer than all these platoons of neuroscientists who had spent their entire careers on the same question. Big surprise there. Every time I entertained a possible function for consciousness, I would ask myself one benchmark question. Can you imagine a non-conscious system doing the same thing? And the answer kept being yes. You didn't need consciousness for learning or for language or to win at Jeopardy or Go. You don't need it to kill your mother-in-law or to create works of art or to have scientific breakthroughs. You don't even need it to reconcile conflicting motor commands to the skeletal muscles. And the clock is ticking, and the book is coming due, and I'm getting kind of antsy because it's kind of hard to write a book focusing on what consciousness is good for if you can't find anything that consciousness is good for. And it was looking more and more like consciousness wasn't good for anything. It just kind of sat up there, sucking glucose and being completely unproductive, like some kind of parasite. And that's when I started to realize nobody ever asks what parasites are for. Nobody asks how the tapeworm benefits the host. Like, what if consciousness was like that? I thought, what if it's the equivalent of, of the cognitive equivalent of junk DNA? What if, if we are tapeworms? Now, from a storytelling point of view, this kicks all kinds of ass. Um, I have developed this, this reputation as being the guy who writes the downbeat pessimistic stories. I don't necessarily agree with that assessment in general. But in terms of this particular book, having a book whose punchline is that the human soul is at best worthless and more likely a bad thing, like you can't get more nihilistic than that. Now, to be, to be clear, I didn't think I was going to fool anybody. I thought that this made a really good punchline for a, a science fiction novel with space vampires. But down in my heart of hearts, I feel that felt the same way that you all do. Like, consciousness has got to be good for something, or natural selection would have weeded it out. But who cares? It's science fiction. And science fiction asks, what if? And this is one hell of a what if. So, I uh, finished off the draft. I sent it to my, my editor. My editor sent back the usual critiques and edits and, and, and changes, and, and I worked on that. And as I was polishing up the final draft for final submission, what should appear in the journal Science? But this, what you got here is two groups of people who have to make a decision over which car to buy, which of two cars. They have 12 variables to consider. One of these groups is allowed to think consciously about that decision for four minutes. 
The other group has to spend that same four minutes being, you know, doing a series of unrelated word puzzles. They're basically distracted so that they cannot consciously dwell on the problem. And the weird thing is, the group that thought consciously about the problem, that black square down there, made consistently worse and more horrible choices than the guys who didn't think consciously about the problem at all. So what we have here is a paper in one of the top-ranked science journals on the planet claiming that consciousness is an impediment to solving complex problems. It gets better. Or it will, if that works. Yes. Remember that, that figure I showed you, the LeBay figure, the half-second finger-wiggling disparity between cause and effect? Sunadel, they fart all over um, LeBay's measly half-second. They found that the brain was making up its mind and, and working on decisions up to 10 full seconds before the conscious self decided to act. This is a paper that came out in 2007, the year after Blindsight was first released. Um, Consciousness as its and its function by David M. Rosenthal. Guess what? After reviewing all the literature on the subject, he decided it didn't have a function. He figured that consciousness was basically a side effect with no adaptive value whatsoever. And when Blindsight first came out, the most I hoped for was that eventually somebody who actually knew something about neuroscience would read it. And they would send me an email saying, you ignorant doofus, this is what consciousness is all about, as anybody with even a basic understanding of the field could tell you. And I would be a little stung by that, but it would also be really cool because at this point I really wanted to know, and I had no clue. But what happened instead was that Blindsight started getting used as a core textbook in neuroscience and philosophy courses. <laughs> it started showing up in actual neuroscience labs. Uh, last month, a guy in uh, um, a bookstore in Berlin came up to me, introduced himself as a cognitive neuroscience, and sort of scribbled his contact info on the back of a napkin in case I ever wanted to get in touch with him and pick his brain about other stuff that I wanted to write. So, you know... <laughs> Who knows, maybe we are all parasites. Maybe in the course of just trying to tell a good story, I just blindly threw a dart over my shoulder and happened to hit the bullseye. Anyway, that's pretty much why I'm here now. Um, Blindsight has proven to be influential to a number of people, ranging from neuroscientists to CEOs. Apparently, there's an astronaut somewhere who is inspired by Blindsight. Um, and as a result of this, some people in some quarters seem to think I know something about neuroscience. The people who invited me to this talk seemed to think I was some kind of neuroscientist. I told them like 10 times I wasn't. It didn't matter. You want to talk about non-conscious processing. Um, but I'm not a neuroscientist. I have a PhD in the biophysical ecology of harbor seals. And 10 years ago, I made a lucky guess. This is the extent of my expertise. That said, once again, nobody knows what the hell consciousness even is. So in that sense, there are no experts. And there are some aspects of consciousness that have been so thoroughly and definitively nailed down that I'm not stepping out of line talking about them, even if I'm not an expert. And at least one of those characteristics is something that I think people should be talking about a little more in light of recent trends in uh, neurotechnology. So I'm going to sort of segue and use the back end of this talk inexpertly to sort of plunge in and uh, try and explore some of those issues. This is RatNet. Um, back in 2015, uh, Miguel Pei Vieira out of, I think, Duke University wired the brains of four rats together using a technique that seems almost too laughably simple to work. He basically just jammed a bunch of electrodes into the rat cortex there to serve as input. And then he like jammed a bunch of electrodes into another part of the rat cortex to serve as output. And then he connected a wire from that, and he sort of circled around to rat number two, and he jammed electrodes into that to serve as input, and so on and so forth, until he had a new type of computing device, an organic computer that could potentially exceed the performance of individual brains due to a distributed and parallel computing architecture, basically a hive mind. Now, if you asked me up front, I'd have guessed that all this would get you would be four really pissed off rats with holes in their heads. But in fact, this Ratborg Collective 
ended up being able to perform a number of tasks, ranging from optical character recognition to really rudimentary weather prediction, generally better than single rats who had been trained on the same task. And this is just one of the more recent examples of a whole litany of brain-computer interfaces going back like over 20 years now. Um, running prosthetic limbs with your brain waves is such old news that teenagers are literally building the stuff in their parents' basements. Uh, we are teaching cultures of live neuron cells to run everything from power grids to stock markets. Uh, the U.S. military is working on the cortical modem, basically an implant plant that plugs directly into, the, uh, into your gray matter. Over at Berkeley, people are starting to work out the theory behind neural dust, um, tiny piezoelectric shards that kind of distribute through the brain or are injected into the system through the bloodstream. Um, basically think of a bunch of silicon sperm cells infesting your brain, reading your synapses and uh, talking to each other using ultrasound. Down at the University of Southern California, Theodore Berger, geez, I've, I've been calling him Thomas Berger for all these years, Theodore Berger, has developed an artificial hippocampus. Now, this is an implant that not only stores memories that the organic brain can access, but you can actually port it to other brains so that you can have someone else's memories. They've done it on rats, they've done it for monkeys, they are working on a human model even as we speak. We are literally talking the first baby steps towards that plug-in that let Neo learn Kung Fu in about 30 seconds back in the first Matrix movie. We are actually starting to build this stuff. Something else we are actually starting to build, neural lace, injectable, syringe-injectable electronics, uh, basically a flexible mesh, a brain interface that you can pump into your head through a hypodermic needle. Once in the brain, it unfurls, it integrates itself into the neurons, the neurons themselves interwine around it. You can have two-way communication between the neurons and the mesh. So far, they're only doing this to rodents as kind of a proof of principle thing. But obviously, the ultimate goal is human implementation. People are already starting to talk about wireless consumer brain interfaces. Now think about that for a moment. Wireless consumer brain interfaces. Safe, easy, convenient, cheap, ubiquitous. You know, think of the medical possibilities. Think of all the wonderful things we could do to cure debilitating and, and, and tragic neurological diseases. Think of the advertising potential. Why, in fact, why even bother with advertising when you can just directly implant an irresistible craving for a certain brand of beer into, directly into consumers' heads? Think about the military applications. You could be damn sure the military is thinking about them. But while you're thinking about all this stuff, think also about the fact that way back in 2008, a guy called Kendrick K. built a machine that could read the voxels right off the back of your head. Basically, it could figure out what you were looking at simply by exploring your brain activity. Now, back then, K. said that someday we would have the technology that would allow us to read dreams in real time. He said that would take maybe 30 to 40 years, and that we should maybe start thinking about some of the privacy implications before that came down the pike. But it did not take 30 to 40 years. It took four years before a Japanese lab produced a device that, using MRI data, could read hypnagogic dreams in real time off the back of your head with 60% accuracy. This stuff is happening way faster than even the experts were expecting. Theodore Berger, the, the uh, artificial hippocampus guy, he once thought that that kind of technology wouldn't exist in his entire life, throughout his lifespan. Now they're talking about wide-scale routine implementation of his artificial hippocampus to human patients within less than 10 years. So what's the end point? Where is all this stuff headed? You do not have to be a science fiction writer to, uh, to answer that. You just have to read the goddamn manifestos. Facebook is working on a non-invasive brain interface that interacts directly with your speech center. It's an interface that they are willing to talk on and on and on about until you ask them if they're planning on selling our unspoken thoughts to advertisers, at which point they change the subject. Ray Kurzweil, currently at Google, talks about cortical nanobots connecting our brains to the cloud. He looks forward to a day when it will be quaint and anachronistic. 
to only have one body. Um, Elon Musk's Neuralink, a big startup, all over the news these past few months, working on a whole brain interface to give your brain the ability to communicate wirelessly with the cloud, with computers, with the brains of anyone with a similar interface in their head. Now, I have read no end of this next step in human evolution. Why, when we are surrounded by all this miraculous computer power, people say, do we still communicate using an interface that hasn't changed in 50,000 years? Why, when we have an interface, or sorry, an internet that reaches all the way to Mars, do we still communicate using our vocal cords and tapping with our fingers? A speech is a kludge. Speech is a, is a workaround. You cannot possibly convey the beauty of a sunset, for example. You can't translate that into a series of grunts or scratches without losing something. So brain-to-brain -brain interfaces aren't just infinitely faster than speech. They're so much more accurate. It turns out that they really you go online, and there's no shortage of people who just can't wait to find out what it's like to be part of a hive mind. But I have news for those people. You already know. You already are a hive mind. You always have been. You may have heard of a, a condition called um, alien hand syndrome. It's a condition in which the body tends to start to go to war with its own body parts. Um, you want to put on your favorite shirt, your evil hand rips it off and puts on something else, a cable knit sweater. You want to jot down a, a shopping list, your evil hand knocks the pendle away, picks up a game controller instead. This is the most famous cinematic portrayal of the condition. I don't know if you guys remember uh, Dr. Strangelove. It's a shriekingly hilarious slapstick comedy about global nuclear annihilation. Came out in the, the 60s at the height of the Cold War. It's just a movie so far, but alien hand syndrome, that's a real thing. It sometimes resulted when the fat bundle of neurons connecting the two um, hemispheres, the corpus callosum it's called, 200 million axons that when it got split. And the rationale here was that by cutting the feedback loop between the, the hemispheres, you could prevent electrical storms from building up in the brain. So it happened in cases of, uh, it was used as a, a, way, a, a radical way of curing certain forms of epilepsy. But the thing is, once, once these, these hemispheres are isolated from each other, they tend to go off in their own directions. They develop their own personalities, their own taste in music, their own taste in clothes. In some cases, perhaps, even their own religious belief. V.S. Ramachandran, um, you've probably heard of the guy, he's kind of a neuroscience rock star. He reports the case of a split-brain patient in which one hemisphere was an atheist and the other was a Christian. And this, this stuff can happen... Yeah. Basically, we're talking... I'm, I'm glad I, I, they didn't want me to use a, a laser pointer. I can see why now. Um, so we'll just jump ahead. Um, basically, it comes down to uh, latency uh, versus bandwidth. Signals pass across the corpus callosum fast enough for the entire system to sort of fire in sync, to integrate and, and be a coherent whole. But when you force those same signals to pass through the scenic route and basically squeeze them through a straw, the, the two halves tend to fall out of sync. You have introduced a time lag into the signal. So the hemispheres are not completely, even when split, they're not completely isolated. They can still communicate through the brain stem, but it's a much thinner pipe and it's a much slower signal. So you can think of it as dial-up versus broadband. And when you split that, that, uh, that brain, I basically decoheres into we because the two halves aren't firing in sync anymore. And this can happen pretty much on the spot. Um, you don't even require surgery to induce it. Ramachandran also talks about a patient who had one of his cerebral hemispheres anesthetized uh, preparatory to brain surgery, but the other half was left awake. And that single hemisphere, unshackled from its partner, suddenly started manifesting new personality traits. Uh, the, the whole brain patient was a shy introvert but whittled down to one core. It became a lot more garrulous. He started hitting on the nurses, telling off-color sexist jokes. Um, that persona disappeared when the drugs wore off, um, obviously. The, the other half woke up, swallowed it whole, 
um, the, the original psyche re reasserted itself. So the, the take home message here seems to be that consciousness, whatever it is, runs on the circuitry available to it. If it's only got access to one core, it'll use, it'll, it'll reflect the circuitry in that core. But if it's got access to two cores, two hemispheres, you don't have two personalities sitting side by side. They both get subsumed into a greater whole. They get engulfed into a single coherent entity. I mean, think about yourselves right now. Chances are everybody in this room is running on two cores. You are all a dual core hive mind. Is there someone else in there with you just to the left of the eyeball screaming to get out because you never let it use the vocal cords? These are the Hogan twins, um, joined at the head, as you can see, um, also from my, my homeland of Canada. Craniopagus twins are obviously pretty rare in any event. As far as anyone knows, the Hogan twins are absolutely unique because they are not just fused at the skull or the vascular system, they are fused at the brain. Um, specifically at the thalamus, which amongst other things acts as a sensory relay. So Krista and Tatiana Hogan share a common set of sensory inputs. If you tickle one of them, they will both laugh. They can see through each other's eyes. One of them can rest her eyes, close her eyes, and still watch television by tapping into her sister's optic nerve. There's some evidence that they share thoughts. They appear to be able to tell jokes to each other without speaking, for example. And while they have distinct and different personalities, they still use the word I when referring to the other twin. So, two identities, one sensorium, all because they are fused at a sensory relay. What if they were fused at the prefrontal cortex instead? If two isolated hemispheres can each run standalone programs and each have their own sapient sense of self and yet cohere into a single coherent self when fused, what about the fusion of two complete brains, a contiguous porridge of neurons spread across two heads? Would we still be talking about two individuals, or would we be talking about one being with twice the neuronal mass of a normal human brain? Now, the Hogan twins have escaped this fate, doubtless because they are connected, as I said, via dial-up, not broadband. But we do know that, obviously, the corpus callosum is a fat enough pipe to cohere a single identity. So, what's the bandwidth of a corpus callosum? I could not find the answer to this online. So I reached out to one of those um, real neuroscientists who liked Blindsight, uh, a dude by the name of Eric Hole. And he scribbled some numbers for me on the back of an envelope. And they're very preliminary, and they're very ballpark, but they scare the shit out of me anyway. Because once you factor synaptic redundancy and signal noise into the equation, the bandwidth of a corpus callosum is comparable to that of your average smartphone. We're still a few major breakthroughs away from an honest-to-God mind meld. But the pipes, the pipes are already fat enough to handle that load when we make them. And in fact, those breakthroughs may happen a lot faster than you expect, because it turns out that the brain is really, really good at doing a lot of its own heavy lifting when it comes to plugging unfamiliar parts together. You can plug a geomagnetic sensor into the brain of a blinded rat, and in very, very short order, that rat will be running a maze every bit as well as a sighted rat using magnetic fields using a sensory modality that all of rat kind has never experienced in its entire evolutionary history. Uh, look at, um, look at rat, net, rat net. Uh, you just jam the fork in anywhere, and the rat brain figures out the interface protocols all on its own, protocols for communicating directly with another brain. Look at the Hogans. They don't have any high-tech neuromancer interface keeping their brains together. They were an accident and they can see through each other's eyes. So I do not think it is completely loopy to think that someday in the not-so-distant future, Netflix will change its name to Mindflix and offer direct, immersive, first-person 
five cents streaming media experience downloaded directly onto the cortex. Whoop. What does that mean to us as individuals? Well, you could always ask that poor bastard that Ramachandran was talking about, that guy who sort of woke up in a single hemisphere and had a few hours to live some fraction of a life before the drugs wore off and he got swallowed whole. Except you can't ask him because he doesn't exist anymore. Right now, that being, whatever it was, has as much standalone personality as your parietal lobe. We do not know what consciousness is or how it works. We don't even know what it's good for. We do know that, as these guys recently declared in the Journal of Machine Consciousness, that the brain can't support multiple conscious processes in the same medium. Consciousness does not multiply, in other words, it expands. It spreads to fill the space available. A true hive mind is not going to be a series of interconnected selves. It's going to be a single coherent self. And all it takes to annihilate you is an interface with the bandwidth of a cell phone. Now, of course, if you keep the bandwidth dialed back, you should be okay. You can retain your identity, right? Dial up versus broadband. But Neuralink doesn't want to dial back the bandwidth. That would, that would defeat the entire purpose of the, of the enterprise. It's right there in, in Musk's mission statement. He doesn't want us sucking through a straw. He wants to eliminate the I.O. constraint. He wants things cranked to the max. He wants a technology that works with your neocortex the same way that your neocortex interfaces with your limbic system. That's, that's, his, uh, that's his analogy. And I think it's a better one than he realizes, because there are a lot of species out there whose entire brains are pretty much identical, functionally, to our limbic system. Those creatures have their own intelligence, their own personalities. If current thinking in the field is right, they have their own consciousness. Neuralink aspires to interface with your neocortex the same way your neocortex interfaces with your limbic system. So ask yourself, now that you have a neocortex, is your limbic system still conscious? Um, I do think that we're going to uh, end up building these, these interfaces more sooner or later. Um, even the naysayers and the skeptics that I've read uh, don't seem to say that it's not possible. They seem to be just arguing about how long it's going to take. And I was surprised how easy it was to find actual working neuroscientists who are quite excited about the project, completely on board with it. This is not to say that everyone thinks it's going to be a risk-free enterprise. Everyone recognizes the risks. You are talking about a technology designed to store and transmit thoughts and memories. So you would be insane not to worry to some extent about being mind-hacked by trolls and governments and, and uh, you know, spam artists. But these concerns all seem to revolve around what happens if the technology breaks. A server hiccup somewhere, a backup fails, the NSA gets into the back of your head through some zero-day exploit they never bothered to tell anybody about. Nobody seems to be worrying about what happens if the tech does exactly what it's supposed to. Nobody seems to be worrying about the problems that would result if everything goes right. This showed up on the internet a few weeks ago. It's getting a lot of links. This, this actually takes up about half the internet now. It's like 37,000 breathless words of gosh wow enthusiasm about Neuralink. I, I grabbed it and I did a word count on it. Uh, the author, uh, Tim Urban, had extensive backstage access to the Neuralink team. So this is as close to an authoritative behind the scenes tour as we are likely to get for the time being. And it goes on and on. It's got diagrams, it's got cutesy little cartoons, it's got a completely unnecessary digression into the biology of marine sponges, for Christ's sake. And in all of that 37,000 words, I counted maybe 100 dealing with the possible loss of individual identity. And most of those 100 words were dedicated to poo-pooing it and saying, hey, no problem. Almost across the boards, the expert I talked to believe it would be the opposite. Technology has thus far enhanced human individuality. Well, I'm really damn glad to hear that. <laughs> 
but none of these experts seem to be talking about the Hogan twins. Nobody's talking about split brain experiments. And I really think people should. Because my suspicion is that when you join a real hive mind, you deprecate from soul down to subroutine. And when that happens, you can forget about pulling the plug because there will not actually be a you left to want to get out again. Now, none of this is to dispute the inexorable logic of the argument for networked intelligence. I completely agree that an interconnected hive mind would be so much faster and so much smarter and capable of so many massive post-human cognitive feats that my stupid singleton vertebrate brain could not begin to grasp. Could very well be the best or the biggest jump in intelligence since the invention of the brain itself. Great for the system. Maybe not so great if you're a parasite living inside it. Now, I don't know, as I say, if I'm a parasite. It was just a punchline to a story. Um, but if I am, I like being one. I would like to go on being one. And maybe the system would be better off without us. But on the other hand, in all the long history of tapeworms, I don't think any tapeworm has ever voluntarily flushed itself out of a nice warm intestine just because its host would be better off without it. And I really hope we don't start doing that now. That's all I've got.